Rising interest rates are really starting to bite deeply into homeowners' pockets. Thomas Moimosia is one of those. He has three young children and has worked at the same job for 23 years. But the only way Thomas could buy a house was through a second-tier mortgage lender. His interest rate started at 5% and has rocketed up. I think 10.1%. 10.1%. Yeah. How are you affording that? Well, oh, to be honest, I'm not really. I'm, I'm borrowing money. I've borrowed money and uh, family, family helps out. My, my adult children help out. <laughs> but yeah, no, it's rough. So what do you bring home? I mean, roughly, what do you bring home Just, a week? Just uh, over a thousand a week. And your mortgage is now 10.1%. What does is that cost you? 900 and something now, yeah. So you have a uh, hundred to two hundred dollars left over. Pretty much. For the, everything else. Yeah. So that's water, rates, power. So how do you get by? Well, there's we've got uh, tax credits. We've had a few food parcels as well. Food parcels. Yeah. From yeah. where? From the the Manurewa Marae, just down the road. What do you think about the fact you've been working for? 23 years in, in one job and you're having to go to the local marae for food parcels? Well, I was pretty, had to swallow my pride uh, for the first time I did it. But yeah, when I thought about, you know, well, what else can, I, can you do? Since you've owned the house, have you tried to move your mortgage to a major bank? Uh, a few times. And the uh, same thing, uh, affordability. Is there a chance that you could lose the house? Uh, yeah, or well, that's a possibility. There's this phrase, the working poor. Yeah, I was just going to say. <laughs> yeah? That is, that's me, yeah. That's me and probably everyone I know. <laughs> uh, you've been working 23 years at the one job, but that's coming to an end, isn't it? Yeah, so the company is shutting down. It's got a trickle-down effect, I think. My, um, I'm a bit stressed, so my partner feels a bit of that. Yeah, the effects it has on my family is quite, it's quite big. Uh, you see it around this area too. It's um, poverty stricken. And that's one thing like, I, I didn't want my kids to see is like, you know, going without, and they haven't. But sometimes we have to go without as parents, so. But they, they, they never to see that because yeah, you don't want that. Thomas Mormoisia, Kiwis really, really don't like talking about their personal finances, especially when times are tough, so we'd like to thank Thomas for being so candid. Uh, the Reserve Bank is likely to raise interest rates again next week, so what should the working poor, like Thomas, do to get by? We showed that interview to Finance Minister Grant Robertson. Oh, I've got huge sympathy for Thomas. He's somebody who's worked hard, obviously, for a long period of time in his life. He wants the best for his family, uh, and, you know, and you've got to feel for him in this situation. I do think um, his circumstances are not exactly typical. It certainly is a lesson about the secondary lending market and people needing to be very careful about uh, getting themselves involved in that. But, of course, I've got to have sympathy for him. Um, he mentioned uh, in, in the piece that he, they're in receipt of family tax credits. They're actually going up today, uh, and we are trying to support families in this situation. Sure, he, he's likely, or says it's a possibility, he's going to lose his house. Is that a sign of things to come? Well, you know, he again, he's in the secondary lending market. He's paying a mortgage rate significantly higher than what most New Zealanders who own a home are at the moment. Mm. I certainly hope he doesn't lose his home, and I would encourage him to continue to have conversations with mainstream lenders to see if there is a way of him being able to carry through. We do know that a lot of New Zealanders are going to be facing mortgage stress this year. We've known that for some time as people go to refix their mortgages at higher rates. Well, that's right. 60% mm. of mortgages are going to, in the next year are going, going to be hiked, mm. aren't they? And how are people going to afford that? Yeah, look, and, and obviously this is a, a significant stress on households. Um, the good news is that wages in New Zealand over the last year have gone up by about 8% on average. Um, we do know that many New Zealanders have prepared themselves for this. They're aware 
aware that this is happening. Certainly um, in the last couple of years, whenever I've been asked, I've always said to people, bear in mind, when you borrow money for a house, the rate you borrow it at may not be the rate that you continue to pay it back at. So people have been aware this is coming. That's right. I mean, this is engineered pain, isn't it? It's an engineered possible recession for the greater good of the economy. But you, know, you want people's income to go into their mortgages, so they're not going to be spending it in the economy, are they? That's, that's what's going to happen. Well, the Reserve Bank have a job to do to get inflation back down. And we all know that inflation impacts on households like Thomas's significantly, just as it mm. does across the economy. So the Reserve Bank has that job. At the same time, we have a job to get the balance right to support people. That's why today you're seeing those significant increases in things like working for families, minimum wage, benefits and so on, because we've got a job to do get the, to get the balance right here. Yep, okay. Granted, all those things are coming into play. Does that mean there's nothing in the budget for cost of living? Well, we've, it all over? we've said that the budget will focus around issues like cost of living, but we do also need to cut our cloth as a, as a government. You know, we signalled very clearly that we have to start reducing that spending down so that we have some long-term sustainability So, so that fiscally seems you're indicating that there's Zealand. nothing left, really. There's I've been very clear that Budget 2023 has been delivered during a very difficult period of time. For example, in order to deliver the basics, the schools, the health system, yeah. the housing, we also have to face up to the the inflationary impact that has on the government spending. So this is a budget that will be about the basics, it will be about making sure, to coin the Prime Minister's phrase, we get the bread and butter stuff right, because that's what New Zealanders need as we go through this difficult so, period. So if you're just honest with them and say, if you prepare them, if you prepare the electorate and say, there's nothing coming, Let's get it out in the open. Obviously, now. I don't deliver the budget um, on the nation um, a, month should, or two, <laughs> a month or two before um, we actually do it. But I have been clear over the course of the last year or so, particularly with the budget policy statement at the end of last year and comments that I've made this year. 2023 is a tough year for New Zealanders. So businesses are going to suffer. We're seeing jobs go. We've seen Today FM announcements. We've seen Sky TV announcements. Some businesses that we've spoken to are sort of expecting or hoping for a COVID-style handout as per the pandemic. Is that a mentality that's a bit of a hangover from COVID? Well, look, you know, I think we worked really well together between government and business during COVID, and we did, as you say, put billions and billions of dollars into supporting the economy. Um, but we do have to return to a position of fiscal sustainability. So Clearly a, through things like the cyclone, when there's been those specific impacts, we're yeah. looking to help businesses and we'll talk about recover that in the moment. from that. Yeah. But there should not be an expectation that there will be a, a, some sort of payment um, to businesses a la COVID. This is a different situation. It's one we've got to work through together but we simply do not have the ability to do that at this time. So businesses should just accept the fact that times are tough and if the economy tanks and they go under, that's the risk of business. Well, times are tough for everybody and our job is to support New Zealanders through that period of time to the extent that we can. But your message, as I've just taken it then, is that times are tough and there won't be a handout. Well, for businesses, yes. as I say, I feel like you know the close to $20 billion that went in to support small businesses over the last couple of years has been appreciated. We'll continue to find ways to support people um, through different programs that we've already got in place. Mm. But the idea of a payment, no, people should not be expecting that. Let's talk about recovery from Cyclone Gabriel and the other weather events. We've been talking to people on the East Coast, on the ground. They say you're not giving them enough money for recovery. $2,000 per hectare, for example, to clean up. One grower told us that it's like $70,000 per hectare. Mm. It's not enough. Well, that particular payment in terms of the primary sector, we've we put in an initial payment. We've done a further $25 million on top of that yeah. in order to support people through this immediate response phase. But those are the limits that you've put in place with that with Yes, that it subsidy. is, because we have to make sure that that reaches the number of people who, who are in need. And we will continue to make sure that we, we support people in that immediate recovery. The next the next phase of it is one where there does need to be some cooperation and collaboration between farmers and growers, their banks, central and local government. And those conversations are starting to happen. I was in Hawke's Bay 
week before last, yeah. talking to people in the horticulture sector about what does a long-term recovery plan look like. But in the short term, when you were in the hawk space, surely they would have been saying to you, we need more diggers, we still haven't cleared this land, yeah, no, and no, it's and extremely ag- expensive. It is, and again, the government continues to find ways of supporting people to remove that silt. But the question well, ha- you asked me, Simon, yeah. was about what happens for those growers and those farmers into the future. And well, nobody I, the question ex- I asked you was about the, the, the amount that you're giving to clean up in mm. the initial stage, and they're saying that's not enough, and there's not enough diggers. Well, the question of how many diggers there are is, is, is you know, a moot point in a way. We're putting the money well, it's not in. For, not for the person. No, but it's a moot point in terms, of of the, the in terms of the government support. Yeah. We're putting significant. I mean, we've put more than $50 million in here, and then no doubt there will be more that comes through in the, over the next little while to support people to do that work. Okay. But the point I'm making, Simon, is the one you've just made to me in the previous questions. This now has to be a partnership between central government, local government and businesses and their banks because Mm. this is actually about the long-term future here. No crops to pick, no fruit, no meat to process. Is the producers down there, how are they going to keep paying their workers? Should there be a targeted wage subsidy for them? Yeah, look, what we're doing is working with some of the larger businesses to make sure that they can keep going. And I accept your point. If you haven't got anything to process, it's tough. So we are talking to some of those larger businesses about the ways in which we might be able to provide some support to allow them to keep their workforce in place, keep their uh, business structures in place as they begin to see more um, uh, of their produce come through. Right. So does that mean a targeted wage subsidy is on the cards? It means more a business by business approach. I think when you think about the wage subsidy type approach, that's when you're, you've got a very broad base of people. Right. Rather than set up that whole system, I think in these situations we're better talking to some of the individual so large to, businesses. So each business will be a separate case? Would, there are you know, a limited number of large businesses and large employers in these areas that when, we can work with. When will they know? Will they have to wait until the budget? Um, we're working with that right now and most of those large producers would have had people come and talk to them. Right. Will they have to wait until the budget? Oh, well, we might be able to see decisions before that. It depends a little bit on the circumstances. Okay, because the Cyclone Recovery Task Force only met in full for the first time Mm. this week. That's six weeks on. Yeah, it doesn't mean that work hasn't been underway. And then Sir Brian Roach, is the chair of the task force, has been doing a huge amount of work with the team that he's got with him. When will the task force and you announce which areas are going to be red zoned? Because the people down there need certainty. Do they move on? Do they rebuild? 100% get the desire for certainty, but we've also got to make the right decision as well. I think it's really important, Simon, to say a couple of things here. Yeah. One of those is... Resilience doesn't just come from managed retreat. It can also come from building up stock banks, changing the way that you build your property. So there isn't just a one-size-fits-all situation here. Second thing to say is after the Canterbury earthquakes, it was four months before a decision was made about red zones. I want us to be much quicker than that, but we still have to go through the right processes. So absolutely sympathise with the people involved, but we've also got to make the right decisions. So you're talking about April. When in April? Well, that'll, we, we can't give you a specific date today, but that's merely a process of going through saying there are some areas where we think actually we can just get on with rebuilding and not concerning ourselves. There are others where there has to be a slightly longer conversation. And we want the community to be involved in that conversation. We don't just want to dictate it. And that's my third point of the things you need to bear in mind. Not everyone in a community is going to agree about what the right steps forward are. So we actually have to bring them along with us. So I get it. Mm. I know people want that certainty right now, but we've got to get the right information, the right data, talk people through it, and then make the decision. But like the growers on the ground down there, they need to plan for Mm. next season Mm. now. They need to order crops now. So and look, we're you moving hundred percent and we're moving as fast as we can. But as I said, if you think about Canterbury, it was four months. I think we'll be able to do it much quicker than that. How is the government going to pay for the cyclone recovery? Queensland had a temporary flood tax. Mm. Will you have a cyclone tax? Yeah, so as we've gone through this, um, it's become clear that we're, we're getting clearer on the scale. And it's hard because mm. we're still learning all of the information. Because we're talking about 10 to 13 yeah, billion maybe Just as total. we've been discussing, yeah. The government's actively working on how we can reprioritise and save money, and that will play its part. Uh, so we'll make those announcements at the budget. But I think the scale of it means that I feel we're, this is manageable for the government, but we'll finalise that in the coming weeks. So manageable means no broad-based tax. As I say, we'll finalise that in a couple of weeks, but I don't think we're at the scale where we need to be thinking too much about uh, huge amounts of additional revenue. 
just finally, disasters, inflation, rising interest rates, possible recession. You recently said that you're confident the economy will start growing by the end of the year. Do you stand by that? I do. And the reason for that is New Zealand's economy is extremely resilient. Now, we've got an economy that's about 6% bigger than it was before COVID. There's a lot of countries in the world that can't say that. Do you think New Zealanders share your optimism? Look, it's a tough time, and I'm not surprised that people are currently feeling you know, under pressure. I get that. All I'm saying is, if you look at our performance as a country over the last few years during the incredible stresses of COVID, we did well. We'll get through this. New Zealand's a country with a lot to offer and a lot of resilience, and we'll be, we'll be going well by the end of the year.